You know, I think many of you in the audience can appreciate that the environment needs a good lawyer. And the environment has a good lawyer in George Kimbrell. I can say that because I know that from experience. Um, he has been working tirelessly as a staff attorney with the Center for Food Safety on these issues of related to genetic engineering and has successfully litigated, he'll talk about the litigation, um, a number of cases that have forced uh, more attention to the environmental impacts associated with um, genetically engineered crops. Uh, obviously, we have a long way to go in this, but, but we can rest easier knowing that we're giving it are all through through George, and that George has stood up to um, the forces here that are foisting this technology on us without having adequate answers to health and environmental impacts. Um, one of the cases uh, that George is litigating uh, actually made its way all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, involved none other than Monsanto, of course, and he's going to tell us about that and where things are headed from here. But we're really appreciative that, appreciative that you made the, the trip all the way from the Northwest and are, will be with us, I understand, over the course of the conference uh, to share the knowledge and strategies for, I think, winning in the end. So I'm positive. I'm positive. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for that very kind introduction. Too kind, and thank you all for, for uh, being here. I'm honored to be here and speak with you today. I am an attorney. Don't hold it against me. Um, I'm one of the good ones. There's not enough of us. Um, as far as winning versus um, losing, I guess I would say um, what, one of the things we say at the Center for Food Safety is you, you don't have to win. You just have to be faithful. So uh, I've got some good stories to tell and some bad ones, but um, I think at the end of the day uh, we are winning. Um, nonetheless, I wanted to call this talk pesticide promoting crops uh, because actually genetically engineered crops are better, should be called pesticide promoting crops. And if you only take one thing from my talk tonight, it's, I hope it's that you understand that those two terms are essentially synonymous. Uh, and the reason is several fold, but I think in the main, um, it's the same reason that I'm here at this conference. People understand pesticides and their impacts on the environments, and I think that biotech brings a whole other cachet with it um, that um, we're still working very hard um, out using outreach and other means to, to sort of uh, stem the tide uh, of, the, of the media um, that the other side has a lot more resources than we have at um, in reframing this debate. So let me see if I can figure out how to use this thing here. Hold on. How do I click forward? Okay, great. Arrows. I know. I understand arrows. Okay. So yeah, so I'm senior attorney at the Center for Food Safety. We are a national nonprofit. We work on a number of sustainable ag issues. Um, we have offices in San Francisco and in Washington, D.C. We've got a membership of about 200,000 strong now. Um, genetic engineering is one of those issues. We, you know, we also litigate cases and work on policy issues related to factory farming, protecting the organic standard, aquaculture, um, irradiation, sewage, sludge, nanotechnology, among others and the, the climate change impacts of food. Um, but I like to, uh, to refer to us as a sustainable ag uh, nonprofit, among other things. I think um, I'm going to, does everyone here know what genetic engineering is? Raise your hand if you don't. OK, good, so we can skip this slide. Um, now, I, I am, a, I am a, I, recently I was honored to, be, to, uh, to teach a class at my alma mater, Lewis and Clark, as an adjunct. It was the first time they've had a sustainable food and agriculture class there. So you'll notice I have a lot of slides, and they're very busy. Uh, I think that's unfortunately a lawyerly trait, and I apologize in advance. I'm not going to say everything on the slides, but um, I'll, I'll give you a copy afterwards if you're interested. Um, and uh, you can just, if you prefer to just listen, um, you, could, you could probably tune it, tune it out completely and, and still get the main, the highlights. Um, okay, with that disclaimer, you know, if you go to Monsanto's website, um, you will, they will teach you that uh, genetically engineered foods are going to help us feed the world. Um, they're going to help us uh, have lower impacts on the environment uh, and now the, increase our yields. And, and now the most recent um, myth which is that they're going to help us solve global warming, uh, climate change. 
Uh, oh, and I guess uh, the, the most basic myth, which is that it's the same as conventional breeding. Um, none of those are true. Uh, they are all falsehoods. Uh, and part of this work, I think, is correcting that, that misconception in the American public. Um, first of all, it's very different than conventional breeding. Um, I think uh, everyone here said they understand what it is, but basically gene splicing using recombinant DNA technology, it's inserting a gene from a, from a species that would never breed in nature uh, into another species. So you have a flounder gene that goes into a tomato. The most prevalent genetically engineered crop, um, Roundup crops, they, they use a, um, a soil bacterium gene that, that Monsanto found in uh, the waste land of its backyard that was the only thing alive that could uh, survive all the polluted chemicals and Roundup that was coming out of its factory. They took, it, took the genes from it, inserted it using a virus uh, into, into plants, and lo and behold, the, the plants became uh, resistant to Roundup as well. Um, 80% of these crops, this is how I started, 80% of these crops are, are, are pesticide promoting. They are engineered to do one thing and one thing alone, not uh, increase yields, uh, but rather to sell more pesticides. They are resistant to these pesticides companies' flagship products um, in the main Roundup. Uh, because of them, Roundup has become the most common pesticide in the history of mankind. Um, in 15 years of promises, uh, this is what we have, um, herbicide-tolerant crops, mostly in these four uh, varieties, corn, cotton, and soy and canola. Um, there have been a number of studies that have shown that overall the adoption of these crops have led to widespread increases in pesticide impacts on our environment. Um, I have them listed there. Uh, Dr. Ben Brooks' work from the Organic Center um, from the last decade since we've adopted crop the, the, in widespread the genetically engineered crops in around two th uh, 1996. Um, the best study on the yields is the Union of Concerned Scientists study. Uh, Dr. Grant Sherman's study uh, that shows that they do not increase yields. And, um, and as one of the earlier panelists, uh, I, was, I was very pleased to, to has already been noted, uh, one of the other major environmental impacts of these crops is that they create superweeds, similar to antibiotic resistance when we overuse antibiotics. Um, similarly, these weeds, um, when the farmers douse the, the crops in Roundup or another pesticide repeatedly, uh, they, they get smart, they mutate, they become resistant forcing the farmer to douse the crop in more and more of that pesticide and eventually revert to more toxic pesticides. And I'm going to talk some more about that. We call it the pesticide treadmill. Uh, and it is the biotech industry's solution to this problem. Um, uh, they, they are, we, what we've seen in the last two years are petitions for commercialization of um, stacked genetically engineered crops, quote-unquote stacked crops, which, which include a, a Roundup uh, resistance as well as a 2D4 or a dicamba resistant in them. Um, so this is, in the main, an American experiment. This is a slide I, um, from the Wall Street Journal from a few years ago here. You can see the millions of acres. Um, in the main, it's us, Brazil, and Argentina, uh, very little elsewhere. As I said before, uh, the HT is, is the herbicide-tolerant varieties, uh, and you can see there the uptick in the, in the different um, in the percentages of those types of crops um, becoming more and more genetically engineered over the last decade plus, the last 15 years. Why have farmers adopted them? I, I, there's a number of reasons, and I could give a whole talk on it. Um, but I like this slide. I think it's a great visual representation. It's from Dr. Phil Howard, uh, and, and essentially it shows the market consolidation of germplasm. Uh, you've got five companies now, Monsanto represented by the red dots, Monsanto, Syngenta, uh, Bayer, DuPont, and Dow uh, that own over 50% of the world's germplasm now. Uh, in the last 15 years or so, they have bought up most of the public seed companies little by little. Um, that um, market consolidation, coupled with a uh, Supreme Court decision in 1980 uh, named Chakrabarty that by a 5-4 vote, the U.S. Supreme Court said we could, mat we could patent life, have allowed these companies, uh, using the, the technology of genetic engineering, to... Um, own the germplasm, patent it so they privatize it, uh, and then engineer it, uh, and, and then sell it to farmers and, and not allow public varieties to have a, a place at the table. The other way this is happening is through contamination uh, of public varieties and non-genetically engineered or natural varieties, and we're going to talk about that some as well. What are the impacts of these crops? Well, I think they're many-fold. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, we've mentioned some of them already. Uh, biological contamination, 
or what uh, USDA used to call adventitious presence, uh, or what we called adventurous presence. Um, I think biological contamination is a much better term for it, but, it, but I think the take home there is that, is that um, the way that we say things, the way we frame things in the law, in the public dialect, dialogue is, 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 is vital. Uh, people understand contamination. Um, and, and we've won that battle, thankfully, uh, due to some of the cases that we've brought. Uh, contamination is now the word that is used. Um, but essentially, that's the uh, mixing of DNA where it's unknown and unwanted. In other words, in wild varieties or, or, or conventional varieties of these crops. And this can happen a number of ways, uh, through bees, through seed mixing, uh, other ways. Um, overall, dramatic concomitant impacts in herbicide use associated with these crops. Um, and the harm to our environment from those herbicides. These are, these are pesticide-promoting cropping systems. Uh, and so it's very important that when we discuss them, we don't just talk about the engineered plant itself. No one buys Roundup Ready corn if they're not going to douse it in Roundup, spray Roundup on it. That's why they pay the extra amount to get the engineered seed uh, and so forth. Um, those are all environmental harms. Um, the socioeconomic harms that go along with that, that are intertwined with it, those have to do with farmers fundamental loss of their right to, to sow the crop of their choice. Uh, if they want to grow a non-genetically engineered variety or, or an organic variety, uh, they lose that ability if their neighbor is growing Roundup uh, ready varieties. The, they, they, the risk of contamination is, is too high to them uh, to, to be able to do that. They lose either their organic market or their non-GMO market. Um, Research. I heard some, some excellent discussion of research on the earlier panel as well. I think in the main, many of the harms from genetically engineered crops are, are unknowns. Uh, that we, we really don't know, particularly on the health side there. I think the, the take home there is, is just uh, there have really been no long-term studies. This is an ongoing experiment on all of us and our families and on the environment. Um, the, the, the reason for that is, again, the patents. Uh, these companies... Um, because they own the patent on the variety, they don't have to allow academic researchers to uh, do any research on it. If you're an academic and you want to do research on Roundup Ready alfalfa or canola or corn, uh, you have to get the, pro the proprietary entity's permission, the company's permission, to do that research. Once you've done the research on, say, monarch butterflies or, or another species, if they don't like the results, they can uh, prohibit you from publishing it or they can redact uh, whatever you publish. Uh, and so a number of academics have written to the federal agencies to this extent on a number of occasions saying, well, we really can't comment on the release of this particular crop or that one uh, because we, we have no way to, to do research on them that's unbiased. And, of course, many of the universities are now funded uh, in the main by these chemical companies uh, to boot. Um, but there are a number of health risks. I've, I've listed them there. I think the bottom line is here that the, the, the basic... Um, scientific principle upon which uh, genetically engineered crops is based that uh, one trait, one gene equals one trait, um, it has been shown to be um, a fallacy. Uh, we, we now know that through epigenetics and other means that uh, the other parts of DNA, what we used to call junk DNA, uh, plays a much more important role. And the way genes work is very much like an ecosystem in a very holistic fashion. Uh, yet we still uh, are, are Moving forward in quote unquote progress, uh, approving and commercializing these crops based on that theory. Um, here I've listed some of the harms that come from contamination in particular. The most, two, the fa most famous two contamination episodes were, were the Starling corn episode in 2001 and the, the more recently 2006 bear rice contamination, in which uh, the, the rice farmers of the Southwest. Um, were contaminated by an unapproved rice variety in Japan, shut down. We, we ship a lot of our rice to Japan uh, from the southeast, and uh, Japan closed their doors once they tested it and, and found it to be contaminated. They lost those markets, and there's been tort litigation uh, to the tune of $1 billion since then uh, against Bayer, and uh, all of the early juries have come in favor of the farmers, which is, which is good news. Um, there's a burden even if contamination doesn't happen on farmers in the cost of testing and pr protection measures, buffer zones and so forth that have to be taken to, from the risk of contamination. How does it happen? It happens, as I said, through cross-pollination, like with alfalfa. Alfalfa is pollinated, it's bee-pollinated, you know, crop. Bees don't read signs, you know. They travel many miles and cross-pollinate between fields, moving DNA. Um, I think honeybees can, can cross-pollinate at six miles distant. Um, it also can happen in mixing 
Um, it can happen through weather events and human error. Um, it, USDA's record is horrific in preventing contamination from happening. Uh, although we don't have much data on post-commercialization uh, because they have disavowed, they have denied they have any post-commercialization authority, the, the evidence that we do have on just the field trials uh, is that contamination happens again and again. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has said to us, don't worry, um, it's not going to get out, um, but it's, it's hubristic, it's hubris. Um, you know, nature finds a way uh, in many ways, and we've seen that time and time again. The most recent was just last summer, some scientists drove around in a car around the Dakotas sampling canola uh, in the wild, uh, which, you know, it's, it, grows, it grows in, like alfalfa, it's ubiquitous in the American West. You'll find it in roadside ditches, you'll find it in um, um, fallow fields and so forth, and they just tested every canola plant they found, and um, by far and away the majority of it was Roundup Ready. Uh, so the canola had gotten out of the fields and contaminated the wild, essentially. Um, this is a slide about the rise of superweeds. I think that this is a um, this will be one of the biggest issues uh, in the future with regards to these crops because of this pesticide treadmill effect that I that I mentioned before. But in general, um, I think it's a it's a paradigm issue. Uh, and so I think at the end, when we talk kind of more about big picture stuff, I'll come back to this. Uh, the general idea is, though, is that, you know, um, how are we going to stop the spread of these pesticides? Is it going to be through, through the use of more pesticides? Not, not in my opinion, uh, but that is the um, corporate response that, that we've seen uh, from the biotech companies. Um, okay. This is an epidemic, by the way. Agronomic scientists have, have um, referred to the superweeds epidemic as the, the worst thing to happen to U.S. agriculture since the, the boll weevil. So this is already widespread. Um, it, is a, it is a serious problem for conventional farmers that otherwise rely on Roundup. Okay, so how do we regulate these crops? Well, the short answer is we don't, or we don't do it very well. Uh, we use a lot of square pegs, and we try to fit them into round holes. Um, we have what's called the Coordinated Framework for the Regulation of Biotechnology, which was set up in 1986. More properly, I think, would have been termed the Uncoordinated Framework um, because it has a lot of loopholes in it. Um, oversight is separated between several sister agencies. USDA is entrusted with oversight of the plants, uh, EPA with the pesticides, uh, FDA with the food. And, of course, there's overlying statutes uh, like the National Environmental Policy Act and the Environmental Protection Act uh, that some of our cases have been brought under uh, that also overlay those statutes. But I think the key, the take home here is that none of these, uh, there were no new laws passed to address the, the novel harms and, and new risks that uh, genetic engineering creates. Um, we've, been, we've been squeezing blood from statutory stones, so to speak, with oversight for a long time now. Uh, in general, we don't have uh, new environmental laws that we need in many areas, but the emergence of new technologies like genetic engineering, like synthetic biology, nanotechnology, uh, exacerbate and highlight that need uh, for new laws and new regulatory mechanisms. Mm. FDA, um, with regards to human health and safety testing, the assumption is that they are the same as conventional crops. In fact, Monsanto and other companies, before they market uh, a genetically engineered variety, they don't have to even meet with the regulatory agency. Um, FDAs, they do no independent testing whatsoever. That's the take home on food safety, okay? They, they have voluntary consultations with Monsanto. That's it. Those voluntary consultations are done behind closed doors. Uh, whatever data Monsanto gives to them or the other um, company gives to them is protected as confidential business information. We don't get to see it. EPA, or FDA rather, does none of its own testing. Uh, they take what they've been given, they ask no further questions, uh, and they approve the crop or the food. Um, we also don't require labeling, un unlike two-thirds of the rest of the world. We are the outlier there. We do not give our public the right to choose. Uh, Center for Food Safety, uh, the others that work with us on this issue, we think this is a, a vital touchstone, uh, and that if these companies, obviously, uh, you know, running away from your product is not a very good business plan, why not la allow people to choose? I don't know. Uh, I think they, they recognize that people, uh, they add no benefit to consumers from these crops or to farmers for that matter. And so to that extent, I think labeling they know would be the death knell for them. Um, we, we did litigate that and, and lost uh, uh, 11 years ago now. 
but as of now, I think um, the labeling issue is one that is out there is uh, still to be won, uh, and there are some opportunities there. Um, USDA uses a statute called the Plant Protection Act that they don't even teach in, in law schools that, um, that even focus on environmental law like Lewis and Clark or Vermont or, or here at Boulder. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a law that we use for, for regulating um, invasive species from abroad um, when we import products. But basically, um, you know, they, the assumption is that the, the crop cannot be commercialized. The default is that it's a, quote, regulated article. Uh, the, the company will petition USDA to, um, for, quote, deregulation, which is just another word for commercialization. Uh, and then USDA, if it can, finds it not to be a plant pest, will, will allow deregulate, deregulation. Um, and, of course, the, 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 the Organic Food Production Act, OFPA, um, prohibits as one of its excluded methods uh, one of the big three that, that we've, uh, as a community, successfully kept out of organic sewage sludge irradiation and genetic engineering. Um, I'm sure many of you remember the first draft of the organic rule did not prohibit genetic engineering, uh, and then 275,000 people wrote in uh, to, to um, USDA demanding, among other things, that genetic engineering, genetic engineering be prohibited from organic, uh, and which the final rule did prohibit genetic engineering. Um, I remember that vividly because <clears throat> I was an intern at Center for Food Safety then in 97, 98, and I spent the whole summer a, with like a Tandy word processor punching into the thing name by name, all the people that had written in, because of course it was postcards then, it wasn't like take action, you know, emails. Um, there wasn't any windows in the room, it was like in a damp basement in Washington, D.C. on D Street near Union Station. So anyways, uh, um, but we, we excluded it from the organic standard. Okay, so what do we do at the Center for Food Safety? Well, we do a number of things. What I'm going to talk about most today is our litigation, but we also do legislative work and policy work as well as advocacy and, out advocacy and outreach um, through our network, the True Food Network. Um, the, the case Jay alluded to, the genetically engineered alfalfa case, USDA first approved this crop in 2005 for commercial production. It's the first genetically engineered perennial crop. In other words, you know, it's not an annual. It's grown three to six years. Um, it's, it's a hardy perennial. It, it, it grows feral like canola in the wild. Um, we thought they were, uh, these are very cute little um, things here. I didn't put those there, but I think they're very cute. And, but we talked about bees and, uh, and f earlier, but essentially it's cross-pollinated by bees. Um, but I think a number of the harms, uh, contamination, threats to markets, this super weeds issue and, of course, increased pesticide use. Right now, uh, less than 10 percent, about 7 percent, uh, the latest USDA's own figures, of all alfalfa farmers, um, any of them, use any pesticide at all. They use cultural practices, for the most part, uh, inter interplanting oats or other means uh, to keep out weeds. This is not a pesticide-dependent crop. Um, alfalfa is the fourth most widely grown crop in our country, 20 million acres. It's grown in every state in the country. Uh, so um, this would be a dramatic increase in the commercial use of genetically engineered crops and kind of a new frontier for them as a perennial. Uh, switching, again, uh, a, a major crop, fourth largest in the country, from a non-pesticide-dependent system to one that would uh, be a pesticide-dependent and pesticide-promoting system. Um, so the, the case, we, we brought it on, on behalf of a coalition of, of nonprofits, including Beyond Pesticides and Sierra Club, as well as uh, organic farmers, conventional farmers, um, challenging USDA's approval. Uh, Monsanto, the, the, the owner of the patent on Roundup, intervened in the case, as well as Forge Genetics, which is a subsidiary of Land of Lakes, um, that, is, that is Monsanto's sole licensee for Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Um, and we won. Uh, in the district court, the judge said that an action that the government takes that would, that would eliminate a farmer's choice to grow a non-GE crop or consumer's choice to eat a non-GE food uh, was, was a, an undesirable consequence, meaning as a legal term of art that it mattered, it was cognizable, um, and that the agency had to go back and, and take a look at the potential environmental impacts of this crop. Uh, so, so this is um, under the National Environmental Policy Act, um, the, the court ordered that the agency undertake the most rigorous review that they can take, which is called an environmental impact statement. Remarkably, in 15 years of approving these crops, USDA had never once 
never once done an EIS on any genetically engineered crop. Uh, so this, this was the first one they had ever done, ordered by the court. Um, in fact, their view until this case uh, in the previous administration, the Bush administration, was that contamination uh, didn't matter, and so we didn't have standing to be in court, um, and, and that, well, Roundup Ready alfalfa was the same, if not better, as regular alfalfa, conventional or organic. Um, and the, the um, story I like to tell about that um, was, was, is, goes like this. Um, we're there in the district court, and the judge questions the, the, the government counsel and says, so what happens if, you know, the bees move the pollen and, and all the organic alfalfa goes away or the, they're, they're, all the alfalfa becomes, you know, Roundup Ready variety? And um, the attorney for the government said, well, Your Honor, um, that would be fine because it's just the same as a conventional variety except it's resistant to this herbicide, so it's, you know, it's better. <laughs> and, and so the judge goes, so you mean it's like a super alfalfa? And the, and the attorney goes, well, yeah, I guess so. And then he goes, so you mean it's like an uber alfalfa? And then I thought, oh, we got him now. You know, he gets it, right? He gets it. Uh, and we did. We won. Uh, and so he ordered them to go back and undertake this, this long review. Um, as I said, called an EIS. In the meantime, he halted the planting and the sale of this crop. This was in 2007. Again, no court had ever done this before for any genetically engineered crop and, and ordered them to the agency to analyze a, a plethora of these impacts. Monsanto, of course, and, uh, wasn't, was not exactly happy about this, and so they appealed the decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, the Ninth Circuit that twice affirmed, once in 2008 and once in 2009. The second time that the Ninth Circuit affirmed, I was, we were pretty pleased. We figured that was the end of the case um, because, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court was the only thing left then, and, and they only took like 80 cases a year, and they get requests, which are called petitions for certiorari. Um, they get about um, 8,000 of those a year, so there's like less than a 1% chance that they would take the case, even if Monsanto asked them to take it. And um, another story, um, you know, a, a reporter called. You, you can Google this. It's true. A reporter called. And uh, I was feeling pretty happy about this. Again, we'd won twice and said, uh, well, what do you think the chances are the Supreme Court will take the case? And I said, slim to none and slim just left town. <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> so, so after the Supreme Court took the case, um, <laughs> my boss, who's also my uncle, said, okay, George, that phrase is retired. You can't, you can't say that anymore. So we put it up in the rafters. I, I can't say it anymore. Um, um, anyway... Lo and behold, the, um, the Supreme Court did take the case. It was the first case they'd ever heard on genetically engineered crops. Uh, that happened in January of 2010. So from around December to, um, of that year, but previous, till about June, I just basically lived, breathed, and slept, ate this case for that six months. Um, it was uh, an intense experience. Um, it didn't look good for us. Uh, our best justice recused himself, Stephen Breyer, because the lower court just, judge, um, Charles Breyer, happened to be his brother, and that was his normal manner of doing. Um, Clarence Thomas, who worked for Monsanto for a while, didn't recuse himself. So we were down our best judge, and they had one already. That, so it wasn't looking good. Of course, the current Supreme Court already is a, is a very business-friendly court. Um, and they don't take cases if they're going to affirm. They take cases when they're going to reverse. Um, it looked bad. Monsanto put in front of them a bunch of home runs for them, a parade of horribles, uh, every wish and desire they could have possibly asked for. They said uh, that we didn't have standing, farmers couldn't challenge these crops, that contamination didn't matter, organic didn't matter, that um, whatever the government said had to go. Uh, they, they had an argument with regards to uh, a full-blown trial hearing called an evidentiary hearing with cross-examination. Um, anything they could think of. Supreme Court um, we successfully dodged all those bullets. Uh, they didn't rule on any of them. Instead, they issued a rather strange decision that technically reversed the lower court but left the ban on the planting of Roundup Ready alfalfa in place. And that was because the lower court essentially had given us two remedies, a belt and a suspenders, one called an injunction and one called a vacator or a vacator, depending on where you are and whether you want to sound hoity-toity or not. Um, uh, but... The, the, the Supreme Court said, well, you don't need the injunction if you've got the vocator. So it took away the belt and it left the suspenders. But the bottom line, bottom line was, after their review, Monsanto couldn't sell its product. No one could plant it, and, and, our, and our environment was safe from it, as well as our plaintiffs. Um, 
So it was a strange decision in that um, they got a lot of press that day uh, saying that they, uh, in the mainstream media, that they had won a great victory. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, on the legal issues, we, we won the case, um, not just in dodging uh, a parade of horribles, but in actually getting a fantastic outcome in that it, it remained, it continued to remain banned. Uh, and in, in, in addition, USDA continued to have to do this study that the court had ordered. Uh, the court also uh, said that we had standing, that, the, that our plaintiffs, the farmers in question, could challenge these approvals, which was uh, – just a, a monumental holding. It means that in the future we can bring these cases, um, no one, you know, that unless they take another case and reverse themselves, which is highly unlikely, um, and challenge these crops as, we've, as we can continue to do. Um, and that this type of harm was not solely an economic harm, another of Monsanto's arguments. It said, why do you need to stop the planting if it's just market damages, if it's just about money, uh, if it's not an environmental harm? And the Supreme Court said, no. What the lower court said was that it was, it was an environmental harm and an economic harm, that this was the fundamental altering of the DNA of this crop, uh, and that the, the economic harm stemmed from that. Um, and so I think um, that awareness through the law um, was a broader cultural shift uh, in that now these cases are, these are environmental cases. Uh, so they won the day in the media, but we won it on the law, and I'll take that outcome every day and twice on Sunday. Um, Thank you, thank you. Um, I wish I could say that's the end of the story, um, but like Paul Harvey used to say, that's uh, the rest of the story. Um, uh, you know, we have another case now, Roundup uh, Alfalfa 2, we call it, and of course what happened now is USDA has done their, their, um, their EIS. Uh, 245,000 people wrote in opposed to the commercialization. Um, they again approved it despite the public outcry and the acknowledged risks. And on March 18th of this year, we filed a new case challenging that new approval under um, the same laws, uh, NEPA, the in, in Endangered Species Act and the Plant Protection Act. You can see the plaintiffs there. It's, it's uh, the same plaintiff group with a few additional ones from the last case. Um, another of our cases is about Roundup Ready sugar beets. I'm going to skip over that quickly to get towards uh, the end here as I'm running out of time. But essentially, it's a sister case to the alfalfa case, very similar harms, um, increased pesticide use, weed resistance, and contamination of organic charred and table beets, which can cr cross-pollinate with sugar beets. Um, and again, we won that case. USDA has now under undertaken an NEIS, the second one it's ever done, on Roundup Ready sugar beets. Um, I wish I could say that's the end of that story, but there have been two follow-up cases to that, um, Sugar Beets 2 and Sugar Beets 3, um, and I can tell you about those um, later if you're interested, but essentially um, before the ink was dry on our Sugar Beets 1 victory, uh, Monsanto and USDA tried to circumvent it, uh, and, and that's what these two cases are about that are currently ongoing. We filed a number of other cases um, on, and, and won a number of other cases on genetically engineered crop impacts here. Um, I've listed some of them on genetically engineered grasses, the growing of the crops on wildlife refuges, and the, one of the newest types, genetically engineered trees for biofuels uh, across the Gulf South. Um, the take home from these cases is that uh, contamination matters as a legal matter. Um, that testing and preventative measures count as injuries and farmers can sue for them, and that we have a new form of environmental pollution, of biological pollution here, which is a growing area of environmental law. Um, you might have heard of the first transgenic animal that's currently on the market now. It's the aqua bounty, or coming to market soon, the aqua bounty salmon. It would be the, the, the abnormally large one there. It looks like it's on steroids. Um, FDA is currently considering approving it. If approved, it would be the first uh, salmon for human cons uh, genetically engineered animal for human consumption. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's it's cold tolerant. It's engineered to grow um, four times as fast as conventional salmon. So it's got the gene of an ocean pout in it, an eel. Um, so it, it it grows all during the year. Um, so if it gets out into nature, essentially, it could crossbreed with native endangered populations of salmon, and it would essentially drive them to extinction because it would be more, more virile. Um, I think some continuing legal questions that we have here, um, where is the liability for these crops? Uh, one, of, one of the things at the end of the day we're working towards is to have a situation where the liability should be with the patent holder. Um, that would be in line with our basic common law, uh, property law, uh, nuisance and trespass law. 
if, if I'm a farmer and you're a farmer and your bull breaks out of your barn and causes a ruckus in my field, you are liable for that. Uh, it should be the same with these crops. It's not. The public's right to know. We believe that the public has a right to know and the right to choose here and um, that these crops should be labeled uh, and the scope of USDA's authority, that they have the authority to regulate them. Um, I want to close by saying that all of the things I've talked about tonight, all of our cases are, are uh, almost 95% of my work, what I do, is about um, stopping the bleeding. And I think that, that the, at the end of the day, what I need all of you and what all of us need to be doing is shifting the consciousness. Uh, and that has to be done on a cultural level. They're both vital. They're both important. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer. I litigate. They say if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, but, but, you know, the, there's other ways to, to do this, and they're all vitally important. We need all of them. Um, and I think that uh, that paradigm shift um, towards a sustainable future, um, not a pesticide-dominant future, uh, is the way we want to go. Um, people might say that that's naive. And I would say that it's not nearly as naive as believing that the current paradigm is sustainable and that uh, we're not going to r- run out of time here on this planet before we destroy it. So, so thank you all for all of your good work, and I'm honored to be here with you. Thanks, George. Um, I know it's getting late, and we have a really busy day tomorrow, but... We can take questions for those of you who have the energy left. And uh, for those of you who want to sort of head on out the door, we won't be insulted. Um, but uh, and George will be around. We don't have a specific workshop on this tomorrow, but he will be around throughout the conference. So why don't I turn the lights up and we can take some questions here. I would like to know exactly what is the labeling. What is the labeling that is done in other places? Well, it says genetically engineered on it. It'll say it has genetic engineered ingredients. It varies from country to country, but it'll either say with ingredients, with genetically engineered ingredients, or genetically modified ingredients, or um, you know this product has been made using genetic engineering. One of those. Uh, sometimes it's with a tolerance levels, like they'll test, and if uh, if an, uh, a certain percentage of the ingredients are genetically engineered, then it has to be labeled. Like Japan, for example, I think has 1%. Um, Europe is 09 uh, Is the Center for Food Safety a product of Ralph Nader? Um, I, you know, I, I know Ralph. I, I know that my boss, Andy, has worked with him for a long time. We're not an offshoot of public citizen. Um, I think that it would be more apt to say that we're an offshoot of the Foundation on, on, on Economic Trends, Jeremy Rifkin's group. I would also say that my, my, uh, my aunt, Kailani Lee, has been to this conference before, and I'm, I know my, my talk, she does a play, a fantastic play on Rachel Carson called A Sense of Wonder, uh, so I hope you've all seen it. But I, I was going to say at the outset that um, my talk won't be near as good as, as her play, so... <laughs> No, it's, it's been approved again. So where we stand is that we're back in court fighting to get that approval vacated or set aside again, and that's going to take a little time. Um, but um, this spring is the first time in four and a half years, yeah, it's being planted. Yeah, and I, I would say that what I'm hearing um, from our plaintiffs and other farmers is that it's not being planted um, – with the urgency that some of the other genetically engineered crops have been adopted. In fact, it's, it's very low in adoption rates this spring, and that's for a number of reasons. One has been the legal cloud that continues to hang over it because of our litigation. But the second is that commodity crop prices are so high right now that farmers can make a lot more growing corn or soy uh, than alfalfa. I don't have a question. I would just like to let everybody know that I am organizing an anti-GMO week this coming week along with a rally at the Capitol Steps on Saturday, April 16th. I have speakers in the field there to speak about GMOs, and I have invited all of the policymaker and decision makers for the state of Colorado. Yeah, yeah and I would, I would say, I, I forgot to put my slide up there for our website, but there it is. If, if you don't know where it is, it's uh, centerforfoodsafety.org where we have a lot of information as well. 
Is there a way other than um, going back to direct legislation to undo this um, underlying assumption that there's no difference between uh, GMOs and normal plants? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way would be to – actually, we wouldn't even need – legislation because it's a regulatory decision, right? It was a it was a regulatory decision that was made without statutory any new statutory authority. So really all we would need would be uh, to be loud enough that it, that our federal agencies and our regulators that are entrusted with protecting our health and the environment would change their position. Uh, and all they would need is a rational reason to do so. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be – they just would need the political will. Uh, it's just the other side is so darn powerful and has so much money on the Hill – um, that that's a, a real challenge. I think what our cases do in part, they're impact cases that are brought not just for their specific case-specific facts, but rather to have a, a larger impact on this public and policy dialogue. And I think that um, finding that these harms are um, meaningful or, or cognizable, like I said earlier, in these different ways uh, uh, chips away at that assumption. Um, if it doesn't matter, then why do they have to analyze it? If it doesn't matter, then why can farmers sue over it? If it doesn't matter, why can there be cases brought about damages by it? They're in conflict with each other right now, and I think at the end of the day, where we want to get is to a place where we have um, liability attached and that the burden is shifted and that folks who want to use these, uh, they have to fence them in rather than have the burden be on, on the organic farmer to fence them out. Um, what's your experience been with the EPA? Do you find them helpful or hindering? They're better than USDA, but that's uh, a pretty low bar. Um, I, I think that, the, you know, that a little bit of both, really. You know, there's good people in all these agencies. It's really the politicians that kind of control the major decisions here. Even with the alfalfa, we saw that, you know. Uh, USDA went right up to the brink of, of having a decision that would have put some restrictions on the crop this time, and at the end of the day, they completely capitulated to the biotech industry, uh, you know, based on political reasons. Um, but I think at EPA, there's um, – they have stronger statutes um, that that helps, and they and they um, so I think they're better, but they're still not where I'd like them to be. Last question. Just a little story. I did my graduate research at Colorado State University, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six and I have a master's in weed science, and I was the only student in the department not funded by a chemical company. And when the chemical company funds the research, they give you the question. And the question is, how much should we use? And the answer is either a pint to the acre or a quart to the acre once or twice a year. That's the answer. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to say I misspoke earlier. Uh, I should have said we have a great lawyer uh, protecting the environment in George Kimbrell, and so thank you so much for being here.